Welcome to the Future of Teamwork podcast, where we explore cutting-edge strategies to keep teams human-centered, drive innovation, and empower you with the tools and insights needed to help your team excel and thrive in today's rapidly changing world. Your host is Dane Grunebel, a seasoned expert with over 20 years of experience in enhancing team dynamics and innovation. How can we leverage the latest advancements in Web3 and AI, not to just improve the way we work, but also to enhance how we connect and build communities in both our professional and personal lives? That's what we're exploring this week on the podcast, the intersection of Web3, AI, and the transformative power of technology in reshaping our work and personal lives. Dane is joined by Eric McHugh, a forward-thinking entrepreneur embedded in the realms of Web3 and AI. As the president of ShopX and the chief growth officer at Data Inc., Eric shares his journey into the innovative spaces of cryptocurrency and AI-driven platforms. In this conversation, they'll delve into Eric's ventures, including ShopX's mission to democratize the Web3 ecosystem for brands and Dada Inc.'s novel approach to AI-powered matchmaking. They'll discuss the potential of NFTs to revolutionize e-commerce, the importance of building genuine community connections, and how AI can optimize personal and professional relationships. Eric's insights offer a glimpse into a future where technology not only enhances how we interact with the digital world, but also strengthens our connections in the physical one. So, teamwork makes the dream work, and we're here to inspire your next cloud for breakthrough. Gather your team or put on your headphones, and let's dive in together. Welcome to the Future of Teamwork podcast. My name is Dan Grunewald, CEO of the Huddle 3 Group, and today I'm joined by Eric McHugh. Eric is the... Uh, president of uh, ShopX. He's also chief growth officer at Data Inc. And he's a Web3 and AI entrepreneur. So I'm really excited to dive into some areas that I find fascinating and uh, know very little about. Uh, welcome to the show, Eric. Hi, Dan. I'm really grateful to be here. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to our conversation. I, I can tell we'll get along. It's, go it's going to be fun. It's already fun. So Eric, maybe for the benefit of our listeners, uh, you could share a little bit about your backstory. Like how did you come to be doing this work that you do. Yeah, sure, I'm, I'm happy to. Well, it's nice to meet everyone. I'm wishing everyone the best. My name is Eric, I'm 30 years old, blessed to be living in beautiful Southern California. I went to school at the University of California, Irvine. And during that time, I interned in Barcelona as a project manager and in Washington DC as a government affairs consultant, which honestly was just pretty funny, just how polar opposite those cultures are. I mean, like Barcelona, you show up at 10 a.m. and San Jose would be the first one at the office. Washington, D.C., you'd show up full suit and tie, like peak East Coast humidity, like 830, and you're the last one there. So after college, I mean, Irvine, I was blessed to go to Irvine. It's a great school. After college, my first job was at Snap Inc., helping craft their ad algorithm. And I chose that specific position for two reasons. The first was location. I mean, I'm from California. Their location's on Venice Beach, which is already pretty sweet. But they bought, a, they didn't have one main campus. They bought a bunch of different houses and warehouses along the Venice Beach Boardwalk. So you'd walk around and work in a bunch of different work pods, which as a company's company culture, I found that to be really cool. And you could learn a lot. And the second reason was right before their IPO. So I didn't get equity or anything because I was late, but I wanted to be around a company going through that type of transformation just to see what that type of energy was like. Yeah. And honestly, it was, it was really fun. It was a great move on my part. But after that I ended up, I'm like, okay, nine to five job. What should I do? I ended up as a bankruptcy consultant, which helps walk Fortune 500 companies through the bankruptcy process. And this is where my entrepreneurship route really took off. Because at that time, this is when I was religiously looking into Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. And the ethos of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency didn't align with the consulting firm. And it's not, it's not because the consulting firm, like they're intelligent, everyone was kind. It was, it was smart people. It's more so the systematic structure. So in a bankruptcy, there are tiers of creditors, tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four. Tier one gets paid before tier two, tier two before tier three, and tier four gets paid last. And obviously me, you, all the normal mom and pops, we're tier four getting pennies on the dollar. So as a consultant firm, we're billing out a client that's going through the bankruptcy process. So we're taking money from the pool that should have gone to like the everyday creditor and being on the phone with people here in their lifestyle, like, okay, this doesn't really align with what I'm doing. So I knew I was going to work in cryptocurrency. I'm like, oh, how do I do this? No idea. So I started going to local meetups in the area. I met their original ShopX team, and we've been running ShopX since. We had a spinoff startup too, which was VC funded in Santa Monica. 
called CarCrev. It replaced affiliate codes for Shopify brands and had over 100 brands using it. The cool thing about that was it's the learning experience that company with that. So we were VC funded. We were working out of an incubator, which is basically a startup classroom. Our neighbors were Liquid Death. Nice. Yeah. And again, this was back when like Liquid Death and those types, it was, there were two people. So like at a young age, I got access to so many different founders where we did just grab lunch. I'm like, what worked for you? What doesn't work for you? And obviously everyone's just happy to share information. So that was a great learning experience for me. And just honestly, that, that in itself was incredibly valuable. Yeah. All that knowledge circles back to ShopX. So that's one of the projects I'm working on right now. And my why behind ShopX, because I think the why is extremely important on why you do everything, is I would like to live a nice, peaceful life. I think that's a lot of people's goals. I found that more difficult to do if the money system was corrupt. And that originally led me to physical gold and physical silver, which originally led me to Bitcoin. And then ShopX is a way for me to onboard people into the Web3 ecosystem at scale. So when you think of ShopX, just think of the Google or Apple of Web3, where a suite of products for a brand to download the app and enter the Web3 space, depending on the business need or business product, they get different benefits. So if you think about like if Nike were to use their products and services, they launch an NFT collection with e-commerce value for their customers, a million customers then purchase that NFT because they want the e-commerce value, not because anyone's forcing them to. That's a zero to one moment for a lot of people. So yeah, so ShopX is it's doing honestly really well. I mean, I recommend researching it right now just because we're adding crypto. But this also leads into the other company I'm working on, which is Dotting, and that's the first ever AI powered matchmaking service. And it's a funny story, dude. The way I got involved in Dotting is a while back, like a couple of years, I was on a podcast tour for ShopX. It was a crypto theme once. I was going to a bunch of crypto podcasts, yeah, doing my thing there. I went on this one called the Crypto Economy. This dude named Mark was running it after the podcast, which I'm pretty sure will do too, since you're Joe, we kept in touch via like Instagram and just kind of became friends that way. And then randomly this Dota Ying company, this like AI butler heart type thing started following on Twitter. I'm just like, what is this? And I'm like, it's kind of funny. That's funny. So we hopped out a call. I'm like, okay, I, well, let's, then we start working on it together ever since. So what Dota Ying is, it's the first ever AI powered matchmaking service. So what we do is we auto generate profiles for you based on your digital footprint and create matches based on their digital footprint. So it solves problems. It solves three major problems presented by the dating app market. The first is on dating apps like Tinder, top 5% of users get access to everyone on the app, creating a skewed marketplace. The second issue is, let's be real. It's like hot or not like Tinder, like you're not really diving to the person. It's like, are they hot? Yes. Are they hot? not? No. So there's that, like there's no real connection. And the third is an incentive structure behind the dating app. So if you think about it logically, what happens if everyone's in a while Tinder does match a happy couple when they get married? What happens in that case for Tinder? Hopefully the happy couple then gets off the Tinder dating app and then Tinder in turn loses a paying customer. Mm -hmm. And since Tinder responds to shareholders, the shareholders don't like that. So they chose to serve the shareholders versus the paying customers. And this results in them relying on something called churn marketing which is essentially keeping people on the Ferris wheel. So if you ever heard someone say, down the app, delete the app, down the app, delete the app. Yeah. That's why. So with Data Inc., we put our users in the position to succeed. So let's say hypothetically, I get three matches, Ashley, Kimberly, Jane. It's like, okay, Jane seems cool. Tell me about Jane. She connected her Facebook. She's the youngest. You're the oldest. Our pattern recognition software says that usually works. On LinkedIn, she's went to a four university. So did you. She follows the same people on YouTube. Oh, you guys both go to national parks. You both go to national parks on your Instagram. That could be a match. Oh, did you know on Spotify, you both listen to this one obscure artist? Oh, did you know this artist has a concert coming up in a month? Would you like me to suggest a date with Jane? It suggests a date with Jane. We go on the date. We, we get married. We, have, we do all that thing. And then from there, it can function as a relationship butler. So it could be like, Ooh. okay, guys, you haven't been out from the house in three months. Your kids are there. We recommend this babysitting service. Oh, did you know the place you went on your second date? It has half off ice cream. So it can help facilitate the relationship from there. And as we get more and more data, like it can see like, okay, dude, you've been on five dates so far with our app. Every time you get to the second date, it doesn't go any further. What are you doing? Maybe try something different. So it can help coach people through that process. And think of it like the opposite of Tinder, whereas like longer you're on Tinder, yeah. the more likely you're going to be on the app. 
the longer you're on data ing, the smarter it gets, the better it gets at matching you. That's so like I could say, yeah, I could say no. It'll show me people similar, but like no, 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 no. Okay, it's like obviously this person has like people similar to him. Let's try a curveball. Let's try the opposite. I say yes to that. It picks that up and then it starts giving me a different variety of matches. Again, with the goal of putting in the user, putting the user in the position to succeed and get on that real life day, because that's where a connection is made. That's super cool. I think we could run about four different shows just off the back of that intro, Eric. There's so yeah, many yeah. fascinating things that you're into. Um, if I was to dive into that most recent one on data and we'll come back to ShopX and and crypto, but from an AI perspective, there's so much hype out there around what the AI can do. And and those examples that you've just shared are very like practical, grounded. They're easy to reach for most consumers. Where does privacy come in as a concern in that environment? Like is that digital footprint out there for anyone to find who's smart enough to find it anyway? Or like how does that play out for the user population? Yeah, so in terms of privacy, that's honestly our biggest objection. It's like, why would I want to connect these sources? What are you guys going to do with it? I don't really want to. And to that, I say, well, the sources are all usually public anyways. And on most dating apps, you already connect your Instagram. So it's something they're already used to. And on top of that, we don't really have access to data. We, we can't do anything. We just kind of plug it into our system and then we use that to generate matches. Got it. So you haven't got like a human scanning through... No, What's no, been done for the last two weeks. It's it's just and at yeah. first of all, I don't I don't think we have the bad power to <laughs> whatever the because it's such a large amount of data and it's getting so advanced that like we won't even have the manpower to do that. Like for example, if you're connecting your Instagram to like any sort of platform now, like there's AI that it doesn't even need the caption to ma- like it can scan the picture itself and see what's there. And like for a human to scan that, it's unrealistic. But on that point, I think it brings up an important point because we're putting the safety where users like safety and comfort of our users really high up there. So unlike Tinder or dating apps where it's like a lot of bots, a lot of rude people, our banning system, I want to keep it as manual as possible, meaning we don't just want to arbitrarily ban people for just whatever reason. I think the banning of a user for like, obviously just being rude or just being like, just, yeah, for reasons, I think that should be a manual process as much as we can do that. Because again, like I was banned off of Hinge for no apparent reason. Like all of a sudden I was just like, I, I didn't even do anything about the app. Who do I appeal to? Couldn't appeal to anyone, just got ignored. I'm like, well, I guess I'm off of Hinge. And then so like for for this one, I want it to be a manual. For banning a user, I think that's a big deal. And I think there should be humans to devise on top of that versus like some arbitrary algorithm flagging you, yeah. banning you, giving you a strike. It's like, okay, three strikes, you're out. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I remember a friend of mine on Facebook had posted something a long time ago about getting in trouble because her young son that had long hair was in board shorts in a picture. And so they were saying that's a, they thought it was a young girl without a top on. And so they, they flagged her account um, for inappropriate pictures. And, and she was like, it's my son. So sometimes you're right. If the, if the algorithm just picks up what it thinks is wrong, it might be punishing the wrong people too. All right. So let's go a level deeper. What you described to me of data ing in terms of, You know, my wife, Claire, and I, if we haven't been out on a date recommending a babysitter or a place to go get a meal or a place to go for a weekend, could that in the future apply to teams at work too? Because that's a different type of relationship, but surely there's a digital footprint out there that would be saying, hey, Dane, I realize that you and Randy haven't caught up for lunch. You guys haven't um, been out talking about the business or about your personal lives and so there's a there's a lacking connection there can you make more of a connection with your team member oh dude i, I didn't even think about that and i can go from the dating so dating is the i think that's the easiest way to part to penetrate the market just because dating apps suck honestly really yeah. badly so people were just like it's opposite tender like okay sign me up so the next phase of this i was thinking of, of it being a community building app meaning like I think community is something very essential for human happiness. I think with social media, I think people are more lonely than ever. So with Dada Ying, I was seeing a future where it's like, okay, find me five guys within 20 miles who train Muay Thai, who are into meditation, who would like to try this taco place. So you can you can build a community that way. And on top of that, so if you want to extrapolate that to the workplace, which the workplace is a community, it can help you build uh, connections just like you can be like a work day. It's like, hey, Eric and Dane, you guys haven't been out in a while. Or Eric and Dane, you guys have never met before. 
But did you guys know you're both into like these random ass interests and you're both, you both, he lives in Tustin, you went to UC Irvine. Yeah. You might want to, you might want to try the dip. So it could help facilitate that. And it would be less awkward too. Cause so the, the reason I like the dating app and it might be kind of comfortable, so to say, but the reason that I think it's going to be successful is I think it solves a problem both from the female perspective and the male perspective. The male perspective, meaning guys, I've seen what my guy, my guy friends text girls. It, it's absolutely cringe. It's like, guys, so it takes care of that. And from, from the female perspective, honestly, girls could choose better. Like it is what it is. Like they could, their choice in men is subpar. So dating, it kind of just connects it. It takes out the talking and does connection for them. So for the work thing, let's say we're working at a company of 500 people, we could all plug in our social media. It could be like, okay, you, you, tr you get in here this time. Okay. Dane gets in around the same time as you. You both like this one specific Russian and you tagged here. Maybe you should go out or it's like, hey, Eric in HR, Dane in tech, John in business development, Kim in marketing. You guys all like this one thing. Maybe a work hangout for there. And then so instead of like an office pizza party, which no one really cares about, you can put your team's data into the thing and it gets just something fun for everyone. Because honestly, now that you think about it, it's kind of hard to plan team media. Like it's even terrible. like the smaller team, it's like, yeah. how, do, how do you find something that everyone likes and you just kind of pick something random? Like it's usually like an escape room or just like walking around in the park. But yeah, with our service, you can find something that everyone's actually interested in. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah, and I actually think that in distributed workforces, team experience is not what it used to be. Hey, we're all going to the local bar after work yeah. on Friday. Team experience is like, well, we've got six people in the Boston area. We've got four people in Orlando. We've got three in Houston. Um, what might th those people who are located near each other want to do? And then if we were going to do an event and fly people in, you know, are we going to do something in Orlando with these groups and something in Boston with those groups? I mean, there's all sorts of permutations that I think yeah, employees no. are going to have to be getting into and yeah. it takes time and, and also i think that's a really cool use case that i've never thought about until this conversation but in the end data uh, ai is really just pattern recognition software and it's a way to leverage your time and i think of dotting as like a uh, relationship butler it's like you can help with social media help with dates help you get from point a to point b but someone could re easily repurpose this for the workforce and help plan events and with with dotting the way we're doing it is we're going to build out a, a structure where you plan the date and it automatically links to your calendar. So you both show up to the date. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, I think that's much more actable for the workplace where it's like, okay, we got the date. Yeah. Does everyone agree to this date or sorry, this workplace event? Does everyone agree to this workplace event? Yeah. Everyone agrees. Oh, great. It's on your calendar now. Have fun, guys. It's going to work the same for sales with customers. Like if I'm trying to get a, if I'm going to Boston in two weeks' time and I want to see five customers, you'd probably be able to find a way to. Oh yeah, hundred percent. All that too. So, so, so it shows you the 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 depth of where AI could take us. Yeah, sales is basically dating too. So yeah. it's also very very helpful as well. Yeah, no, I I love this conversation just because I like the way you look at AI. It's similar to the way I look at it. Where it's like I view technology as a completely neutral thing, and so whoever, however, is if, I think dating is a positive spin on it. So like I know a lot of people are doom and gloom. It's like oh, terminate this, terminate that. But like no. There are tons of positive use cases like dotting, what we just talked about. And it could, for example, scan all our medical records. And then it'd be like, okay, the people who, ex who have these traits exhibit this disease in 10 years. You may want to check it out. And that's just something us humans, we don't have the capacity to analyze. So we'd miss that. So there, there are going to be good ways to use AI, bad ways to use AI. Luckily, I think overall people are generally good people. So I think the good ways will outweigh the bad ways. Yeah. So I think we're on the right path. I believe you. In fact, I, I always like to say that if someone's burying their head in the sand and saying, I don't want to use AI, then they're missing an opportunity to actually be one of the people that influence the good outcomes because the bad agents will always use it for bad. They'll use it. Yeah. So you have to use it too. Exactly. So so yeah, fill yeah. fill the vacuum up with more positive and hope and connection. I loved your point on community building. I think that's a big plus. That was a deep dive on dating and AI, but let's go back to crypto because when you shared the story of being in bankruptcy consulting and how it didn't tie into your ethos, that really sort of light bulb moment for me, I was like, oh, I'm interested to dive into the ethos of crypto. What, what is it about crypto that uh, I saw here you were talking about uh, and Web3, I guess, because they're two different things. Um, you were talking about the freedom economy on your LinkedIn profile. So so what would the the crypto web three construct be for listeners out there that aren't really that familiar with what it is and what it stands for? 
Yeah, so the important thing about crypto and Web3 is I think long-term Web3 is going to be the future. And when it's the future, when it's mass adopted, it'll be just going on in the background and no one knows it's happening. So it's not necessarily something people need to understand. Yeah. But in terms of the difference between Web1, Web2, and Web3, let's just think of Web1 as read-only. So in Web1, you can go online, you can read stuff, which again is innovative in itself because that's mass spreading of information. Yeah. Web2, the easy way to frame it is a social media like Instagram, Facebook, and all that stuff. So you can read and you can write, but you can't own. So for example, I create an Instagram post. That's me writing that post. You read that post, you're interacting with it, you're doing what you will. But in that case, Instagram owns the post. So they can sell it, sell my data. They can they can cancel us for any particular reason. Like in the future, it's like 10 years on the line. These guys said something we should have said. They're both gone. Yeah. So that's the, that's the problem with Web2. It's like we don't own our data or content. But in Web3, it's read, write, and own. So in Web3, you can read content, you can write content, and you can own content. And that content can be in the form of money. So that's what cryptocurrency is. That's why I think cryptocurrency is so valuable. Like if you saw what they did in the, like, my, oh, it's like they built it for like a second. If you saw what they did in Canada where they just kind of took the trucker's money, that wouldn't be possible with Bitcoin if you would take custody of your private keys. Or if like so, someone's spending their life building out a YouTube channel or Instagram channel, that's their livelihood. And then YouTube gives you those arbitrary, or like your friends, that arbitrary like three strikes, they cancel you. It's like, well, kind of should have luck. So Web3 solves that. So let's say and my area of expertise is e-commerce. So let's say hypothetically, I create my own content in Web3 in the form of an NFT. I then gift you the NFT or you purchase the NFT, however maybe you end up with the NFT. There's now a connection between me and you. So I can send value your way and you can send value my way. And the cool, so an e-commerce would be like the form of like product discounts, early products, and real life events. So the cool thing is, since you own that NFT, if I so choose, and this is probably Amazon, but if I so choose, I can't, I can't, even though I created it, I can't take it from you. Instagram, Amazon, they can't take that NFT from you. The government can't take it from you. The only person that has control of their NFT is you. And how do you, if you think about a really simple, practical use case for an NFT in e-commerce, how would I use an nft to if i'm planning to buy a product where does an nft come in as more valuable than me just using my credit card yeah so in terms of nft e-commerce is a really easy use case so what shopx does is we provide a platform for an e-commerce brand to launch their nft collection and how whatever they want to add to that nft in terms of e-commerce value they totally can right so we have we have the easiest way is okay um i have that nft nft holders that get early access to this product before everyone else because it's a limited time offer or NFT holders, they get access, they get a discount. Or for example, like NFT holders, you can access to a specific section of the discord. You can talk with the founder. You can do a lot of things in terms uh, of community building. So just think of it as that access pass to specific benefits. And I would say our main use case was in terms of like um, our first use. So we have three tiers of clients like enterprise, like Fox's new show, Kapopolis are using us. If you're, on the, if you're on the crap chicken, you get access to content, you get access to merch, your chicken may show up in the show, so it's creating that relationship yeah, between the true. fan and the show. Yeah. Our mid-tier example is a mag park, and their biggest issue was, like it's a hometown store in LA where like they have a basketball hoop. Customers are like a teen, like kid, like older than kids, but they're buying like hyper hats, so that, that type of crowd, they shoot the hoop. Their issue was whenever he released like a limit time hat drop, bots would clear out his inventory in less than a second and then resell the hats on the secondary market. So he launched an NFT collection, meaning that sometimes only NFT holders get access to the product. And this completely stops the botting, like 100% of the bots, they can't get through it because they don't own the NFT. Wow. And the third use case, I would say, this one's really cool too, just because it goes back to the freedom economy giving. I, I personally like the small tail brands because I think the big brands are going to get in regardless of what they do, they have money and resources. Yeah. But how do we make it easy for the small, just like everyone on the Shopify store? So this particular person, he's, he's called Huxley Jackson. He's a dog on Instagram, obviously run by a human. But he had an audience, but he didn't have a product yet. So what he did was he launched his NFT collection prior to the release of his product. This someone acted as like a Kickstarter type thing. So he was able to raise money, create his product. And then because people already bought in and have the NFT, he had a base of customers who bought the product from him. So it kind of solved a lot of problems for him. Yeah, that's interesting because I've heard, I know Tim Ferriss in 4-Hour Workweek was talking about getting pre-orders before actually bringing the product to market. But a pre-order isn't cash where 
a consumer is actually paying cash for the NFT to be able to yeah. have yeah. access to the product. It's a bit different. No, no this is great too. And I, I love that you bring that up because like the mag park, whatever, it's a new additional web th- stream of web three revenue without shipping out a single product. So you get the money up front, you get the relationship with your customer, and then you have a base you can sell to because in e-commerce, the average conversion rate is around one to 2%. But in web three, because they've already purchased your product, we're seeing conversion rates of around 80%. So wow. you already know who you're going to sell to. So let's say you create 500 passes, you know 400 products are going to probably sell out. Yep. So you kind of know how much product you have to make. So you have to do that guesswork. And on top of that, you can do fun things like, okay, well, I have 500 passes, 400 and it gets sold. Let's do a drop for 200. Yeah. And then that sells out. It creates hype. And then the cool thing is to going back to giving the power to the people. Let's use the Magpark, for example. Yeah. The customer owns NFT. So Mickey, the Magpark, they don't own the NFT. The customer does. So if the customer wants to sell in the secondary market, and for a profit, they totally can. And on the brand side, they can program on royalties, meaning they, if the customer sells on the secondary market, they can get paid. But let's say hypothetically, Mickey Soar, the Mag Park, becomes the next Nike, the next the Fear of God or whatever, 20 years down the line, then the value of the NFT pass should theoretically go up. So it's a way to share the wealth of the company with the customer versus a shareholder. So it, it's really just a win-win for everyone. I really like the way you frame that, Eric. Um, yeah. And I'm a big believer in game theory, so I think that there are... Game theory is clutch. It's awesome. Yeah. And, and yeah. there's definitely gaps in the market right now where actually if customers and service providers, product providers put their heads together, they could build something bigger together, but they need to have suitable incentive to, to be doing that collaboration. Correct. So it sounds like that's what the no. Web3 can achieve. And I like what you said, because most marketers will disagree with me on this sense, but I, I think the most effective and most the most valuable form of marketing is authentic word of mouth marketing. But most marketers don't like it because you can't really track that. I mean, like I tell you, you tell a friend, the friend tells a friend, like you can't track second, third, fourth order effects. Yeah. But at the same point of time, like if you recommend something to me, I'm much more likely to look into it because of like how tired of I'm just like add, add, add. So like, first of all, stop, stop spying on me. Yeah. It's like, I don't want to buy it. But with a word of mouth marketing effect, that really gets exponentially big with Web3 because of the ownership. It's like a timeshare where if I have a timeshare in Hawaii, every time you go to Hawaii, you're saying my timeshare was if I don't like, I don't really care where you stay. So in crypto, it's common for people to change their PFP to like their NFT to show that they're part of the community. And then they get super annoying and tell everyone about their crypto project. Hey guys, check it out. But we've seen that in the e-commerce space where like brands, customers are changing their PFP to their NFT and they're telling everyone about that NFT because it's because again, if, if you feel like you own part of the company, you're much more likely to represent part of the company. Yeah. Because again, you're you're incentivized. Like, hey, I own part of the company. I'm talking. I have a Discord chat with the founder. What do you have? I mean, it's a good it's a good company. Yeah. And then like your friends and family more like to go. So it gets it gets the word of mouth marketing effect going, which I think is honestly just I think that's an underutilized method of marketing, which people try to ignore. Because in terms of like fancy boardrooms and corporate stuff, you know, like everyone's like KPI, KPI, KPI. It's like. I spend a million dollars. I got 500,000 impressions. Well, how many sales did you get? Well, I got 500,000 impressions. That's like, but this one, it's just like, okay, well, people are actually talking about it in the background. You're, you're getting into their group chats. People are shilling the product in other people's spaces. And again, it's the people to people connection. It's like, you're not getting hit with that. It's like, okay, well, this is a person. I, like, I'm much more likely to listen for that reason. Yeah, you're totally right. So I've got two questions. Um, the first one is PFP. That's not a, a, a an acronym I'm familiar with. Oh, profile picture. Profile picture. Got it. Yeah, so. Man, I must be getting old. I do have a profile picture. So they changed the profile picture to the NFT. Correct. And in Twitter, you would used to get like a special shape for that. Ah. So like, like it, yeah. So it's like if you're in a guild, you change your profile picture to like the guild clan type thing and then you just kind of represent your guild that way. Interesting. So that's creating a bit of community belonging there too. Yeah. Because you'll see other people in the community and they, like their pictures are PFP. They'll start identifying because I think this is why NFTs will win long term. Yeah. It's because people are attaching emotional value to their NFT. Like yeah. on, if you go on, if you check out crypto Twitter, you see some of like the Bored Apes or some of the more successful programs. Yeah. They are their ape. It's not the other way around. They identify as the ape. So they're attaching extreme amounts of emotional value to their PFP. Like I know people who just won't sell regardless. Like this is my thing for life. So we could transfer that energy and that attentiveness into the e-commerce space. Like this is my company. 
I am I'm I'm pink mocha holder number seven. Seven is the best number. It's not my lucky number. Yeah. Every other number's dumb. Seven is where it's at. <laughs> That's so cool. I like the way you talk about uh, attaching emotional value to we recently, in fact, I'm wearing it today. We recently built a new logo for one of our brands, Leader. And my daughter came and helped me design it. So she and I yeah. were playing around with this AI like branding tool and we were playing with colors and everything else. Anyway, now that we've got the business launched and we made an acquisition and things are moving, she wears the t-shirt like two or three days yeah. a week. Like she really attaches value to it and she says it's comfortable. But um, Probably is. Yeah, <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, that's really interesting. So the second question is tying into the workplace again, kind of like we did with uh, Data Ing. So from a crypto web three, you know, ShopX environment, you and I were talking pre-show about work pods and, and the beauty of small teams. Does this mean that if I develop a really cool component or service offering that I could more easily attach it into, you know, partnering's hard. So can I more easily attach my product or service offering into other larger projects? that I wouldn't have traditionally have had access to. Oh yeah, hundred percent. And honestly, this is one of my favorite things about web three is web three functions off composability. What composability is, it's essentially the compound interest of software. And what that means is people build off each other. So you solve a problem once and you build off of that. So with ShopX, we're a small team. We try to keep as nimble as possible. Everyone runs in their own lane. And if, for example, we do have outsourcing work. So like, for example, for tech, we just did an integration with WooCommerce. The way this was done is we had our devs run project lead. They work with a project manager from a third party dev studio. They manage it from the top, but we outsource a studio. So we can do that for marketing. We can do that for, for tech. We can do that really for whatever. It's just about having that trusted cord, knowing they'll get their stuff done. Yeah. And this goes into, and again, this, is, this doesn't have to be on a comp, like within the company, it can be companies working together. So for example, ShopX, our biggest client right now is Fox Studios. Their new show, Kapopolis. Yeah. And that was a bunch of different Web3 startups working together to get that project off the line. So ShopX handled the token gating section. MoonPay handled the, I guess they handled the payment section. BCL, they handled the marketing section. Fox's internal team, they did their thing. So it was all of us putting together a piece of the pie, working collaboratively to make that thing work together. Then like when it was time to launch, we had to make sure everything worked well. We had to test together. We had to make sure everything did, everything did, did its job. And then the launch was super successful. And now we all get to share in the benefits of the success of the launch. because So it's not 3, just it's, fee for service, it's, it's a fee and a royalty of sorts. Yeah, so however you want to, however you want to sell it, you, you can. Mm -hmm. So, so ShopX, we earn a fee whenever someone mints an NFT, but for ad hoc work, um, we charge a dev fee. We also have the first ever tokenized software license model. So if like in our model, if like, uh, let's say you're a Shopify brand. So bigger brands, they often, they're used to bespoke solutions, meaning they have their own custom tech stack. The, like Nike obviously has their own custom tech stack. They're not on Shopify because they're Nike, but they're used to paying third, they're used to paying third parties, developer fees for integrating with their dev team and building the solutions that way. But let's say you're, and again, back to democratizing Web3 for all the brands. If you're on shop, any Shopify brand, whether who, it doesn't matter where you are, your level of skill, you can download the ShopX app and then you can launch your NFT collection within five minutes. So to Whoa. download the app, yeah. So the tokenized software, our tokens function as tokenized software licenses to en enter our ecosystem, you have to get the right amount of licenses. And because of your licenses, if you ever want to leave the ecosystem, you can sell them at an authorized third party for whatever you want. But for a brand on Shopify to enter Web3, you just download the ShopX app, like going on your iPhone and downloading an app, you create an account. And then within the Shopify app, you can launch a NFT collection in less than five minutes by filling out two forms like name, picture, pricing, how many passes you want made. You click create. And since we're already integrated with your Shopify store, you can just add products from your Shopify store, deciding like how long you're gonna token get them for, what products get token gated. So that's the e-commerce value to the past. And then you as a brand, you can change it whenever you want. So yeah, we made the process super simple for everyone. Yeah, that's very cool. So I'm, I'm going back to one of your earlier comments that it can almost replace raising capital if you go out and sell NFTs for this new product ahead of time. And then you've got the demand, you've got the cash, you can now contract with the manufacturers to bring the product to market. Um, is there a way 
in, in the Web3 world where the cash is kind of held in escrow so that now when I'm doing a smart contract with a, a contract manufacturer that they can see, oh, Dane's already sold 100,000 NFTs for this product and I'm going to build it and and I know he's good for the money because it's already sitting in this whatever it is, blockchain or, 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 or anything else. Yeah, no, so that's totally possible, especially with Web3. I mean, it really is just code. So what you just have to do is just write that in the, write just your your specific metrics within the smart contract. So this one, it's like, okay, day and sells 500, whatever. He gets the rest of the money released to him. So that, that's totally possible. That'll be more of a custom dev job. But really, that's not that hard because you just hire a dev, you just, you'd work with a developer, they'd hire it. And then I would say the most important step is getting that code audited because in Web3, it comes with ownership, meaning you lose your money unless like it's not like exactly you can call chase or anything yeah it's like it's in the ether yeah so just just hire a good dev get the contract audit to make sure everything works and then you should be good to go interesting because i've got this belief around small teams and, and particularly in communities i think there's a big opportunity right now to put power into the hands of the people to say hey you're a, you're a return to work mom You've got a great relationship in your community through school, church, sports clubs, whatever else, and you want to start a business. Well, you've already got access, going back to positive word of mouth, you've already got access to loads of consumers that trust you and have a relationship with you. How do you find a product or a service to offer? So if, if that's kind of part one of the thesis, let's, let's try and put more power in the hands of people in our communities existing. And then part two is if I'm a product owner or a service owner, um, rather than me going out and hiring salespeople and spending big marketing budgets to access that community, I just I put some kind of program together to go out and find that return to work mom or retiree and, and say, hey, go out and sell this many NFTs in the community and you now have our franchise for that district. It, it actually could create uh, an acceleration of sorts of um, people finding new jobs and businesses and large businesses finding speed to market. Oh, no, 100%. And for these examples, I, I think it's be good to combine just AI and Web3. So for the first part, you're, you're a mom, you're, you're trusting your community. And I think AI, I think it's a tool to unlock people's creativity. It's like, you're a mom, you have your trust community. It's like, yeah, that's kind of a business idea. It's like, all right, I have this idea. What do I do? With AI, you can like, okay, spend me out 50 logos. I like logo B, make it happier, make it blah, blah. Okay, I have this logo. What do I do? I need copy for my website. AI spelled the cop copy for the website. Oh, I need the website itself. AI do code. So before this mom who just probably didn't have the capital or the like mind, just like I need to hire five different people. She can do that all with AI. Yeah. Now our business is up and running. So like not just like a mom, like a kid in India. So everyone yeah. can try a little bit. Like people are people are gonna be able to use this as a tool of leverage. But your mom has your business. Great. She has a business. She has her followers. What's next? For any startup, the most important thing is getting a core base of customers. Like I, I think having your like your core, your strong squad, that's important. And that's where the NFT could really come into play. So this mom, she can get her she can sell 50 NFT passes. And then we've actually seen this where like people it was a coffee company yeah. where like if you own the NFT, you're the only one who could sell the coffee to your specific area. Yep. So she could fran she has, if the word is franchising, yeah. I'm not sure the normally I would say that is, but the legal is lagging. Not, not legal advice in any way, but yeah. So for example, this one, people with OFT could sell the coffee product and they would sell to stores, thus earning a profit for them. So this mom could sell 50 NFTs. The important thing is she can, the, the link between the mom and the NFT orders is there. So if she wants to give benefits in the form of allowing them to sell the product, they can. Benefits in the form of in real life events, they can. Yeah. Benefits in the form of like this kind of product or whatever, they can. And then that's up to the mom to decide. And then on the flip side, the owner of the NFT, it's like, the mom can't force them to do anything. It's like, well, I don't want to do it. It's like, well, it's, I don't have to do it. Yeah, but they paid something for the NFT, which has allowed that that entrepreneur to go and bring something to market. So there's there's an exchange of value at a base level, and then it hopefully accelerates and incentivizes a continued creation of value for that wider network of teams. Yeah, and it could spread that way too. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's really cool. All right, so final question, getting back into the larger workplace environments. If you've got uh, an NFT in play, obviously you're talking a lot about product businesses, but do you see service businesses being able to use it for a way to almost 
book capacity. So if I'm a, let's say I've got a marketing agency and I want to be able to uh, deploy a whole bunch of projects, like a large rebrand for one customer, I want to go and do a huge in real life event for another customer, and I'm going to use a whole bunch of gig workers. Is there a way, do you think that that Web3, that NFTs allow you to almost say, I've, I've got commitment for this many hours from a proven um, freelancer, and, and does it allow you to almost bring those teams together virtually and, and make sure that there's a quality of work product that goes with you know, using these distributed teams? Yeah, I like this conversation a lot just because this isn't a way I've ever thought about NFT. So it's firing different neural pathways in my brain and it's starting to make sense. So for example, I had a conversation with like a school where they were talking about creating their NFT because what an NFT is just programmable data, but it's it's verifiable on the blockchain, so you can't exactly fake it. Yeah. So they were talking about implement and that was way like far off just because school moves slow, but like they were talking about creating their diplomas in the form of NFT so they couldn't fake what call what classes they took. They couldn't fake the GPA. The employer could see the NFT. They can verify that. So on the flip side, an employment badge could function as a as a work badge. So it give you sp- access to specific places on the website. So instead of like going to North and getting like clearance to this area, certain departments could get access to specific parts on the website. And on top of that, it can give your work history. So if you're a gig worker and you have NFT as a badge, it can show in real time what you've done in the past, what your rating is, and all that stuff to ensure a quality of product for the entrepreneur who's employing gig workers. And someone, yeah, I could see this working actually, actually, because I've used VAs in the past. I could yeah. see this using very, very well in the VA, very well in the VA community, just because the name of the game of VAs is just you have to find a good one. It takes a while. Yeah. But if there's a verifiable, verifiable way to do that within the VAs or gig community, there's 100% a use case. And honestly, one of my favorite things about Web3 and ShopX in particular, we'll just use that example and extrapolate. The space is new. So each individual brand is playing around the technology and trying something new that suits their business needs. And then other brands are seeing that and copying and optimizing that. So just like you mentioned, there will be different ways to use Web3. People will figure it out and optimize off of that. So in terms of the workplace connection, I'm sure there's a way. And if, if someone can benefit or just add value by using NFTs, they will. Yeah. Someone else will see that, then they'll build off it. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a big experimentation right now. And I think that's the best part. I think that's Which is fun. exciting. It's exciting because we've yeah. seen a lot of experimentation in more of an analog world. There were lots of boot camps that used to say, hey, come, we'll teach you how to be a software developer for free, but we're going to take 10% of your income for the next however many years until you pay us back. And, and that's kind of clunky where it sounds like if it's on an NFT, um, hey, p- buy this NFT and we'll set a royalty up such that every time you, you get your next job in our platform, people are paying you through the NFT and it's starting to stack not only your portfolio of work and your ratings, but it, it's stacking the appropriate allocation of, of funds against the, the training investment up front. Yeah, no, that's all you can tell me to that. And the, the company itself, they could partner up with a specific bootcamp, specific dev studio. Yeah. And then there could be a specific section for the NFT holders to access where they apply or they start working. And that's just an easy way to track there. And as they're working, you get a lot of T so you can see exactly what they've done. If like this employee did a great job, he's great. Well, this one hasn't done much. And there's no way to fake that. Cause in NFT, it, like the, the thing is ownership, it's like you can't really rent. So you can't really just ride off anyone's coattails. You, you have to do it. You have to do the work yourself. And if you could do the work yourself, um, I think you should be rewarded. And the cool thing about this is I think it fixes the incentive structure. This might be a little bit deeper, but I think it fixes the incentive structure of the world. So like in terms of crypto, like uh, let's say in the fiat world right now, if I want to be rich without doing anything, how do I do that? Yeah. I just, I place myself next to the money printer. I extract money from the money printer. I give that money to my friends, the form of contracts and the form of like quid pro pro. Now they're in a high position with me. And then from there, they we get more corrupt people in, and thus corrupt people win are in. They'll beat the non-corrupt people because they use corrupt methods to defeat the non-corrupt, methods, and that's how we get our government. But in the in the NFT world or in the crypto world, how do I how do I get rich? The only way for me to get rich is to produce a mass amounts of value for people. So Dan, if I want your NFT, if I if I want your Bitcoin, how do I get your Bitcoin? Well, I have to produce a product or service that you want, and then you have to voluntarily give me your Bitcoin. And so if I can scale that up. I get rich, but the cool thing is this isn't like fighting over like a slice of the pie. We're increasing the size of the whole pie where everyone wins. Yeah. 
which goes back to that game theory. I love it. So that soundbite that you hit produced mass amounts of value for people. I think that's a a great closing note. That's a great hope for the future of teamwork and leaning into Web3 and AI to uh, to support that value creation in communities. Well, Eric, this has been a, a great conversation. I've certainly learned a lot, not having done a lot in this space before. And uh, it's just fun. I appreciate your openness to just riff and bounce ideas around and see what may or may not apply to to teams and the workforce from what you're seeing already in uh, some very effective applications that you've been part of. No, and honestly, dude, I really appreciate you having me the podcast. I, I had a fun conversation. The, the riff is where it's at. And to the listeners, I'm honestly just wishing everyone to be the best. And um, if I can support you in any of your endeavors, just feel free to reach out. That's neat. And Eric, where do people find you? Is it LinkedIn, Twitter? Where, where are your main places to be? LinkedIn and Instagram are probably my main places. If you just want to just talk Instagram, Eric D. McHugh, I can send the voicemail. But if it's more of a professional request, LinkedIn is probably a better bet, but my inbox is pretty slammed. But if you're interested in either company, ShopX Web3 Commerce, S-H-O-P-X dot C-O, Data Ing, the first ever AI-powered matchmaker, D-A-T-A-I-N-G dot I-O. Awesome, Eric. Well, we'll make sure we drop those with the show. And we'll definitely do some more collaboration together here in the future. 100%. Thanks for your time. Thank you for joining us. Remember that by embracing vulnerability, trusting our intuition, and approaching challenges with compassion, we not only strengthen our teams, but also pave the way for a future where collaboration thrives. If you're hungry for more insights, strategies, and research on collaboration, head over to thefutureofteamwork.com. There, you can join our mailing list to stay updated with the latest episodes and get access to exclusive content tailored to make your team thrive. Together, we can build the future of teamwork. Until next time.